My sister, who lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, was in Illinois last weekend for uh, our cousin's wedding when she received a phone call from the Woodbury Police Department, the suburb outside of Minneapolis that they live in. And the police officer introduced himself by name and gave his ID number to assure that he was an actual police officer calling her. And he said he's calling to do a welfare check on her 11-year-old son, Keegan, my nephew, because they had received a 911 call from a frantic group of boys that had called because that morning their friend, Keegan was not on the bus. He didn't show up at school. After school, they all went to my sister's house and they rang on their doorbell and they noticed the cars were in the driveway. The dog was in the house. The dog was barking and running around. And so they thought for sure something was wrong. And so one of the friends, little boys with a cell phone, called 911. And because you call 911 and you think something is wrong, the police officer says, well, I drove out to your house. And by the time I got here, there were about 10, 10 to 12-year-old boys who by the time the police officer got there, they were frantic. And when the police officer got out of his car, he said that the boys looked at him and said, our friend Keegan is dead in the house. <laughs> this is a true story. And the police officer like, hey, calm down, kids. Why would you think he's dead in the house? Because we looked at Keegan's window and, and the car is there and he wasn't at school and the dog's barking. And when we looked in his window, there's a bloody sign that says this. And here's a picture that my sister took of his window. <laughs> and so in an 11-year-old, 10-year-old boy mind, they thought their friend had been murdered and was dead with a bloody finger wrote on the window, help. And my sister started laughing and says, sir, I can assure you he's with us at a family wedding in Illinois. And that is a Halloween decoration that he put on his window. <laughs> End of story. Everybody's fine. Okay. Now there are a couple awesome things about that story. The first one is this, the imagination of 10 to 12 year old boys. That's awesome. The second thing that's awesome about that story is my nephew, Keegan, has some really good friends, <laughs> right? Who actually exemplify the three things that this series, I Heart Chula Vista, is all about. He has friends that are for him. He has friends that obviously are regularly with him. And he has friends, even through their disturbed 11-year-old imagination, called 911 because they were trying to serve him. And that's what this series is all about. Here's the way we sum up all three weeks of what we are learning and trying to do in our community and for the people that we love, who are our neighbors, our coworkers, our family. We sum it up in this way. Grab the outline out of your program. I want you to be a note taker today. And here's how all three weeks of this work together. Welcome everybody online. Any of our other churches joining us. Here's how this all fits together. Write this down. To be a church for our city, we must be with our city so we can, say it out loud, serve our city. That's what this week is all about. If you missed the previous weeks, watch them online, download the podcast. We want to be a church that is for our city. We are for everyone because God is for everyone. We, when you are for people, you make time to be with people, to listen to their needs, to share life with them. Why? So ultimately, you can serve them. And hopefully, as you're going to see as we end this idea of bless, we earn the right and God creates the opportunity for us to share the Jesus story while we serve them. That's what this whole thing is about. Now, our foundational Bible verse for this, this whole idea of being people that bless people, realizing that the church is not a place where you just come to sit but it is a place where you are fueled up and fired up to be sent out there every single day as everyday missionaries to serve on Jesus' mission. This idea is throughout scripture and really one of the first places we see it is kind of our foundational Bible verse for this blessed strategy and lifestyle that we want to live as Jesus' people. Um, and it's found in Genesis chapter 12. And it's, it's a promise that God makes to a guy named Abram. Now I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna leave out certain words. 
When I pause and go like this, that's your cue to say that one word, not two. Say that one word out loud, all right? I think you got it. Here we go. Genesis 12, 2 through 3. This is God's promise to Abram. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a And all the people on earth will be through you. This has always been God's plan. And it actually, I would say, is known as the first law of blessing. The first law of blessing is this. That whatever God gives us, it it must not just stay with us, but it actually has to flow through us. This is the first law of blessing. That God makes this promise to Abram that he would so bless his life that the blessing would flow on him, but it would flow through him to other people. And God made the same promise through the nation of Israel, the same promise through Jesus. And it's what he wants to do through the church in our world today as well. And so here's what you need to know about God's intentions for you. Here's part of God's intentions for you. Write this down. Jesus' plan is to transform us through blessing us. This is really good news. The blessing will only transform us, though, when we allow it to go through us. Here's why this is such good news. Because this this breaks apart a lot of misconceptions that people have about God and maybe even that you have today. And that is the idea that Jesus wants to transform us by guilting us. God wants you to make you to feel really, really bad. And if you feel bad enough, then maybe you'll get good enough and right enough. That's not the gospel, the good news story of Jesus. God isn't trying to transform us by scaring us. If he scares you enough, you know, about heaven or hell, then maybe you'll get everything. No, God's not trying to transform us by guilting us, by shaming us, by scaring us. He wants to change us through his blessing in our life. But it only happens when we allow it to come in our life and then go through our life. This is the law of blessing. Think about it this way. I've given you a little, here's what we've done here. Hold on to your hats. We've combined Bible truth with mathematical principles. Okay, get ready for it. Here it is. Write this down. Blessing plus serve always equals transformation. But blessing minus serve will always equal stagnation. This this is always how it works. When we don't share the good that God has given us, the blessing can actually go toxic in our lives. When we don't share ourselves, our time, our skills, our abilities, our resources, when we hold all that blessing for ourselves, it actually begins to build up and suffocate as it piles around us. When we keep everything God gives us only for us, we actually become more entitled. We begin to think that, well, I deserve this. I'm owed this. I work for this. I made that happen. Everything is mine. And this problem is actually kind of like the problem that all children have, right? I mean, how many of you right now, whether you're in a parent viewing room or outside or here in Chula Vista, how many of you currently have children that are, let's say, five and under? Hold your hand up if you got that. Well, first of all, you made it out today, okay? Like, just clap it up for that. You should should feel good about yourself. You made it out because that is not easy, okay? Uh, But those of you that don't have kids under five, like I don't have kids under five anymore, uh, you need to, let's let's remember back, because all children go through this. And I specifically think of times like when we would take our kids to, you know, SeaWorld or Disneyland or someplace like that. And, you know, you're there all day and they've been watching that like Mickey Mouse ice cream bar. And finally, at the end of the day, you give in and you pull out $26, for, you know, one Mickey on a stick and your kid starts to eat that. And I don't know if you're like me, but I feel like as a parent, it is my right to taste test and sample what I give my children. Is this an unreasonable request? I don't think so. And so, you know, inevitably my five-year-old would be, you know, eating the Mickey on a stick and I would go, Hey, give me a taste of that. And then they'd look at me as if now all of a sudden I'm speaking an alien language. Like, you know, and inevitably they would say no because they think that that Mickey on a stick, they would go, no, it's 
mine. Your kids did the same thing, right? All of us still do, do this. Um, and when they would do that to me, I don't know about you, but I mean, something would rise up within me and I would just have this righteous from Jesus anger. <laughs> because in my mind, I'm thinking, yours? You own nothing. <laughs> Everything you have is actually mine. And so then I would just rip it out of their hand and eat the whole thing. That's why they're going to need counseling someday. No, I wouldn't do that to my kids. Why? Because I am sometimes a good father. All right? Like, that's why I wouldn't do it. You know what Jesus said about God? That he is always a good heavenly father. And aren't you glad that God doesn't do to us in what I just described that I wanted to do to my children, right? Like when we hold on and we hoard on and we just make life about us, God doesn't look at us and go, mine? Because he has all the right in the world to look at us and say, everything you have, the ability to work, the ability to come up with that idea, the breath you breathe, the resource, everything is a gift, Scripture says. Everything that we have is actually a gift from God. And aren't you glad we have a good Heavenly Father who doesn't rip that thing out of our hands? What does He want to do? No, He wants to bless us, but He wants to bless the world through us. This is the way of Jesus. Jesus showed us what serving looks like in one of the most significant kind of Bible moments and stories like in the whole big story. We're going to look at one story for the rest of our time. It's in John chapter 13. It's Jesus in a room sharing a meal with his best friends the night before he was going to die. And so it's his last moment to say his most important words and to teach his most important lessons. And what is one of the most important lessons that he wanted to teach his friends, those first followers, those first Jesus disciples? Well, let's look at John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Here's, here's the story. It was just before the Passover festival, the Jewish holiday. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Talking about his disciples. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, let's just give some cultural context and be clear. Some of you read that and like, is Jesus standing there in his boxers? <laughs> right? Like, removed. Did he take his shirt and pants off? This is Middle East 2,000 years ago. They didn't dress the way we do. Regular cultural clothing would have been essentially an undergarment that would have been like a short sleeve onesie skirt, essentially, right? That's what everybody wore. And then there was an outer garment that pretty much was from, you know, neck all the way to, to feet, uh, kind of like a, a robe, essentially. And so Jesus took that off and he grabs a towel and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Let's just pause right there. Would anybody be willing to admit that they are a foot person, like they actually like feet. I mean, anybody, you just like be honest and confess that. All right. A few of you, we have a support group for that. <laughs> Meets on Friday night because feet are nasty, man. I don't care. Like I'm not a foot person. Um, and, and here's what you need to know. Again, cultural context. Jesus, he, they, they don't wear closed toed shoes at this point in history. Okay, this is Middle East, dusty, desert, dry, dirty climate, you know, just because of, you know, desert and, and walking on roads, not paved like we have today. And so imagine everyone wearing sandals, how dirty your feet would be just on a daily basis. So to wash someone's feet was to actually humble yourself in the most extreme way. In fact, this was the lowest status position and job you could have or do in that culture. And so imagine this, Jesus, God in the flesh, humbles himself 
and takes the lowest position that exists in culture to serve. This is what Jesus did. And Jesus did this to give his disciples a picture of what a good heavenly father's love is like. A love that serves and blesses, not a love that demands and takes. This was a radical act of love. And here's a very, very, very important truth that we learn from this story. Go ahead and write this down. Jesus came to serve and he asked his followers to do the same. I would even add this a little stronger word. Jesus came to serve and he expects his followers to do the same. Because laced within Jesus' service to us is this expectation that those who are served would turn around and serve. Laced within God's expectation of blessing is that those who he blesses would turn around and bless others. This is the way of Jesus. Let's read the rest of this because Jesus doesn't just give that to interpretation. He, in fact, says it very clearly. Look at the rest of the story. Let's skip down to verse 13. When he, Jesus, had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place, meaning he, he returned to his place at the table. The next thing that's about to happen is communion, which we're actually going to celebrate together at the end of this message. He returned to his place at the table and he says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be, what is the word? Blessed if you know them. Is that what it says? No, no, what does it say? You will be blessed if you what? Finish it. If you do them. What Jesus is teaching here, he's telling them the way to be blessed isn't just to know the right thing. The way to be blessed is to actually do the right thing. And Jesus says, you have seen me do it. I made it abundantly clear. And this is how it works. The most amazing thing about this story and this moment, here's what it is. I don't want you to miss it, is this. Notice Jesus does not, after he washes his disciples' feet, he does not turn to them and say, now that I've served you, you serve me. You wash my feet. Jesus doesn't do that. Why? Because he doesn't need our service. He's God. In fact, what Jesus does, it's astonishing. Because most of us, what would we have? We would have a quid pro, pro quo, right? Like, like, here's how this works. I do for you as long as you only do for me. Right? Like, like hey, I'll give, I'll forgive. As long, are you going to? You know, I'll help you as long as you help me. But this is the kind of God we have. He doesn't say, I washed your feet, now you wash mine. He actually says, I washed your feet, I served you, and the way you serve me is actually by serving others. I washed your feet, I blessed you, and the way you show your love and gratefulness to me is that you love and you bless other people. God's going, I don't need it, but you're going to be my people and you're going to do it for everyone else. This is the way of Jesus. And this is actually why we do Serve Weekend. It's why every year we do this series. Because we want to be people and we want to be a Jesus community. That we just don't know the, th the truth. But we want to collectively kind of put a stake in the ground and say, at least on this weekend, here's what we're all going to do. We're going to go and be the church. We're going to put the words of Jesus into practice. We're going to live out this way of Jesus that he says is about blessing and is about serving others. And so here's my question is we're at this last week before Serve Weekend. Will you join us? If this is your church, will you be all in, 100% participation? Because there is a project that will fit your schedule, that will fit, you know, if you're going, I'm not sure I want to do this or that, you can be a part of this. Next weekend, we're not meeting in here, but we are still meeting. We are going to be the kind of church that Jesus expects his church to be out there. And everybody can do something. I was looking last night um, 
on uh, uh, iHeartCV.com and I was looking at, hey, what projects are left open? I think we have only about 400 volunteer spots left open, which is awesome. So all of you that have already signed up to serve at a project, that's great. But I just took note of a few projects that still have some openings. Let me just highlight a few of those. One of those, I think there's still about 18 spaces, at least last night there were, uh, where you could have a car at Trunk or Treat. Uh, and you could be a part of that outreach as we bless kids and just create a fun environment on our community. There's a new project that we're doing that we didn't do last year that we're doing this year um, in partnership with Chula Vista High School. We have four projects on the campus of Chula Vista High School. Any alumni in the house? Chula Vista High? All right. Welcome. You need to serve there. Um, we have four projects happening at Chula Vista High School. That's a new one added this year. And we want to bless and we want to serve. And so I think there's probably about 30 spots left there, all sorts of different projects, painting, all sorts of different stuff on that campus. Um, Community Through Hope is a great organization right here in Chula Vista that partners with our, our city council. It partners with our police department to serve the homeless population right here in Chula Vista. And we are doing a food drop-off. So even if you've already signed up for another project, you could sign up for this one. Last night, there were 80, we need 83 more people to purchase specific non-perishable food, and we have a drop-off happening here all weekend to bless Community Through Hope and our local food bank. Um, we also have Hope Zone, which again, the minimum you could do is, is to, like this one, we are gonna have a blanket drive. This is a ministry across the border in the worst area of Tijuana, Zona Norte. Um, and as we're getting on winter uh, and, and homeless families and kids, we're doing a blanket drive. And so that's another one. Even if you're signed up for another project, uh, you could buy a blanket. That we're dropping that off here. We have big group projects doing landscaping uh, in different places in our community, all sorts of stuff. But here's what I'm asking you to do. If you haven't signed up for a project yet, do it before you leave today. Don't, don't just come and sit and then kind of next week, because I know you have other options. There's some good NFL games on next week. I already looked at the schedule. And believe me, as a guy who works every Sunday, I was thinking about hanging out at home. No, I wasn't really thinking about that. Yes, I was. I'll be honest. I was totally thinking about that, you know. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to as many projects all day, every day as I possibly can and be there and high five you and see you and say way to go and see our church at work in the community. And I want you to be a part of it. It's going to be awesome. Now, why do we do this? What's the big why for serving? Whether it be collectively as a church family or individually. Why should you serve your neighbors? Why should you serve your coworkers? Why should you serve people in our community? Why do we do this? Here's our big why. Write this down. Here's what it is. We serve so we can share Jesus' story. That's why we serve. This is what it's all about. This is why Jesus served us. Why did Jesus serve us? So that we could be back into right relationship with God. This is always the goal of service. There is actually something bigger than just meeting an immediate need. The hope is that we earn a right to meet a spiritual, eternal need. This is always the goal of the church. And we have a great Jesus story to tell. And here's what I want to encourage you as a Jesus person. Don't ever be scared to tell the Jesus story. You never force it because that's weird, right? You don't get in the elevator on Monday and go, oh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> going up or down? Because every one of us someday are either going to go up or down. Because they're going to look at you like you're a psycho if you do that. That's not what we do. What do we do? We just simply look for the opportunity that if God creates it, that we aren't intimidated to share the Jesus story. And let me tell you how easy it is to share the Jesus story. We've been talking about it for the last three weeks. It's as simple as three words, for, with, serve. It's what God has done for every person in humanity. You can tell the Jesus story if you remember these three words. You tell your friend, did you know that God is for you? That he loves you more than you could ever imagine. Did you know that God wants to be with you, that he sent Jesus, and Jesus took all of our sin upon himself on the cross because he served us so that every one of us could be in a relationship with God? That's the Jesus story. For, with, serve. This is the core of our 
faith 